engineer at Morgan Stanley, uh, local purveyor of logos, obviously, uh, and also a taker of very serious pictures. Uh, so I am here to talk about uh, what I think has hitherto been an untapped source of knowledge, an absolute gold mine of information, and that is our business application source code. And that might not be the first thing that everybody thinks of is like, where do I go for knowledge? Let's go to the source code. Uh, but it actually makes pretty good sense for anybody who's ever written a business application. I don't know if anybody out here has been involved with that. Okay, I at least got at least one person. Oh, two, all right. Um, anybody who's done that knows that a, a whole lot of domain knowledge goes into that. I mean, to, to write a business application, you really need to understand the business. And in a lot of ways, the programmers do start to become business experts. And so there's a lot of domain knowledge that goes into that code. And so shouldn't we be able to pull that domain knowledge back out of the code when we need it? And what's an example of when we need it? Well, have you ever wondered what the application is doing? So you've got a business application. Uh, you know what it's supposed to be doing, but have you ever wondered what it's actually doing? That might not be the same thing. Um, and have you ever wanted to maybe explore what it would do in different other scenarios, given different different sets of data and whatever. Um, has that ever happened to anybody here? Some smiles, yes. Well, uh, I have some examples of people who really do want to know what an application is doing, and that is regulators. So I come from a finance industry background, uh, and to say that finance is heavily regulated would be an extreme understatement. It is actually, uh, there are teams, projects, companies, ecosystems, all dedicated to financial regulations. And one thing that they want to know is, what is your application doing? Is it actually doing what it says it's doing? And when you deliver the data to us, is that data what it really should be? And so they want you to prove that. Um, and that all leads to really interesting questions as well. Like, if you're a trader, and you're trading in a certain product, you might wonder what regulations pertain to that product. And you might wonder because it affects your bottom line. And also, if you get it wrong, you might go to jail. So it's kind of important. Um, and so there are a lot of systems that, that are, you know, technologies that are there to let people document all this knowledge. Uh, but it, anybody, again, who's built these things knows that these specifications and the actual implementation tend to diverge over time. And so it's difficult to keep these things in sync. So wouldn't it be great if the source code could document itself and explain exactly what it's doing and instead of having to go separately and ask a developer, uh, what is your source code doing? You could just have the source code explain that to you. And that's basically what we're here to talk about. So. Uh, what, to, to, to start off, let's think about what is actually, what is the domain knowledge that is in code? Like, so I mentioned before that domain knowledge goes into code. So let's see some examples. And I'm reaching into the uh, very exciting world of, of financial regulations, not because uh, I couldn't think of anything better, but because it's actually a pretty good representation of, of you know, this concept. And it, this doesn't just apply to finance. It just doesn't apply to, to just regulations. It's pretty applicable, I think, to any business application. But let's look at what we get in, um, in a regulation. So we're gonna look at a regulation called the liquidity coverage ratio, which is a regulation that um, its purpose is to make sure that large banks have enough money to cover catastrophic situations. And this comes to the banks in hundreds, <laughs> in hundreds of pages of, of specifications with some helper documents. And it turns out that those helper documents, when it comes to like a business specification, are actually really, really good. Um, it's one of the best business specifications I've ever seen, if, despite it being very large. And so one of the things that the LCR specification does is it has a whole section dedicated to describing the elements that it needs in order to run the calculation. And it describes it in great detail. So for example, we have this currency and what this chunk of text is saying is that the LCR uh, it requires that the currency 
the cash flow involved be in one of the G7 currencies? And if it's not in a G7 currency, then it needs to be converted to USD. And so for all the elements that go through this regulation, they have actually provided this definition. And so they've built up a glossary for us and uh, a taxonomy. And then they go on to say about how all this flows through the regulation. So we have the relations of all these things. And so they've actually built up a nice ontology for us. And then they go into the actual logic, the business logic of the regulation. And the, biz the way the LCR works is that it, um, it takes all the cash flows of a firm, it categorizes those, those into buckets, it then aggregates those buckets up, and then it uses those aggregations in a series of calculations until it finally reaches the, the top here and gets the final result, which is one number. The whole thing just results in one number. Um, and so the information in here is, well, first of all, you've got the business logic, which is very important to know exactly what your application is doing. Uh, and hidden in there as well is the data lineage. So all those elements that they defined before in the previous page are running through all these aggregations and categorization rules and calculations and we can actually extract the full data lineage if we can piece all that together into a holistic program. Uh, and so that's very important. So data lineage is huge in the financial industry right now because regulators want to know that the data that you're passing to them is of good quality. And in order to know if it's a good quality, you have to be able to track it through the systems and understand what the systems are doing to that data. Uh, and so Right now, it's like a forensics exercise. Well, it is a forensics exercise, actually. It's like uh, going in and, and trying to discover, because a lot of the times the data is scattered all over in very different systems. And so developers go in and they try to figure all this out, just like they would in a forensics exercise. And so wouldn't it be great? Oh, sorry. Uh, and the reason that they do that is because when developers are taking all this in and building the systems, they're really just thinking about execution, right? All they have in mind is, look, I've got all this domain knowledge that I'm bringing in, but really all I wanna do is make this thing run. That's what I'm kind of getting paid for. Uh, and so that leaves a big gap. So things like transparency, uh, lineage, all those kinds of things, those are afterthoughts, if they're thoughts at all. And so, yeah, so now wouldn't it be great if we could take all that information that's in the program and actually make that just as important as the execution. And how we, might we do that? Well, I'm gonna introduce, despite what this says, I'm gonna introduce a technology called Morpher, which is a Linux Foundation open source project. It was contributed to FinOS, which is part of the Linux Foundation by Morgan Stanley. And one of its goals is absolute transparency of applications. And it, it's founded on functional programming. So it takes the approach that functional programming is a great way of describing business applications and business problems because it is very precise in describing the data. It allows you to, to describe the semantic meaning of that data. Um, and then it's very precise in defining the logic as well. And so that turns out to be very useful in describing business applications. And so what we're looking at here is we took the, uh, so as part of the FinOS organization, we took the LCR, the liquidity coverage ratio, and completely implemented it in the, the Morpher technology. Now Morpher is very careful in that it doesn't dictate a language. It didn't create a new language to do this. The core of Morpher is the intermediate representation. Um, and so it's, it's, it's essentially, if, you, if you're gonna store and share and process business logic, Computer science solved that problem a long time ago with, with IRs, and so that's what we do. We just take an IR, and that's the core of everything. And so that leaves us the ability to use different languages to author business logic. As long as we can compile it into Morpher, it's cool. And then it lets us transpile it and, and use it in, you know, just like any other data at this point, we can start doing interesting things with it. And so what we're looking at here is back to that glossary that was defined in the LCR spec, uh, what we did was we took the glossary items, we programmed those in a functional language called Elm uh, and created strong types for each one of those elements. 
Um, and then using the morpher tools, we go in and extract that type information out of the IR and we deliver it to whatever data dictionary, data catalog, you know, integrating into the, 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 the knowledge tools that the firm might have. And so what we're looking at here is just the, the data dictionary representation of all that glossary information that came in the spec, but through Morpher, so directly out of the program so that it's always in sync. And the advantage here is that it doesn't go out of sync. This is what's in production. If it goes in production, it, this is analyzing that production code and pulling that right out. So it's always in sync. Even more interesting than, than Getting into the lineage, uh, using Morpher again, all those aggregations and categorizations and calculations that we described before uh, were implemented in pure functions. And so now we've got a whole function, uh, a, a, you know, a whole set of functions that lead up to the, the top level function, which is the LCR. Uh, and by analyzing again through the, the graph and the IR, we can pull out the entire set of data lineage through the, whole, through the whole program. And so what we're looking at here, it's, it, you know, it might not be the most natural way, but we're starting actually at the top level at, a, at a, one of the calculations. We're going down through the aggregations, and then we're going into the uh, categorization logic as well. And, you know, this is an attempt to display that. I'm sure there's better ways to display this, but all of this is generated straight out of the code which is the important part. And all this can be pulled out of the code and handed to other tools that are better at dealing with this kind of information. Which brings up um, transparency. So one of the other things that, that Morpher provides is tools to go in and see how data would behave in an in application. So I'm gonna give all right, cool. I'm going to give a little demo here of a little bit of the application. So this is just a, a, a little function here. And what this allows is the user to interact with an application and understand the business logic. And so right here, this is a simple flow chart that if our collateral, cla collateral class oops, is G2Q, then um, if the if it's yes, then our the, our result for this function is the amount minus the collateral value times uh, eighty five percent haircut, and so we can plug that in, which is what I've done in this, and see how the flow is going to go. And similarly, if it's different, if it's the the, the second case, the S one Q, we can plug that in and see how the flow is going, and we can see the the results as well. So in the, in the first result, we see 150 is the value. Second result is zero. And then the third result is 1,000. So if neither of these cases are, are true, just take the amount. And so in this way, the, the user can really understand what the application is doing. Question. This is like a transpiled version of your business logic? Yeah, so, so the question whether was whether this is transpiled. And yes, this is transpiled from the IR into HTML or into interactive code uh, using a JavaScript transpiler. It's interactive? It is interactive, yeah. So I can go in and, and change any of these values if I could learn how to use a Mac real quick. Um, so... So you can tell I'm from finance because I don't know how to use a Mac. So here, I just went in and, and did the G2Q and we see that it, the, the flow changed. So it's actually executing that in the browser. That's the same logic that's executing in production. It's just that we transpiled it to JavaScript in this case instead of Scala or, or some other technology in, in another case. You're dynamically changing the input. Can you change the business logic itself to what if you like instead of 85%? Wow, transpiled. <laughs> Yes, yeah, that's a good, good, good question. Yes, uh, you could change the business, but yeah, we would have to retranspile it. Um, so you can't change it on the fly yet. It's something that, that we've been looking at, but yeah. Um, I sure. Um, could you use this to drive a QA process? Like basically, 
planning lots of data at that logic to see if there are edge cases that the logic yeah. can do. The question, yeah, the question is, can we use that to drive QA? And the answer is yes. You can start using fuzzers because fuzzers are, are so a fuzzer is a, in, in functional programming usually is a, is a tool to find all the edge cases. So it generates, it, it actually looks at the structures because the structures are absolutely precisely defined. Um, and it tries to find edge cases to those structures. So if, it, if you're taking a number, it tries to, to take the edges of those numbers. And if you're taking strings, it sends like all kinds of crazy strings. Um, so some of the other things that we can do that I, I hadn't planned on going into, but um, so, so that the, uh, the, the, the code that I put in there that, that tests it, you can save that out and use that as unit tests. And so that plugs into the whole unit test system so that users can go in pre-deployment um, pre and, and go and check and make sure that the logic is doing exactly what they think it should be doing, save that into unit tests, and that becomes part of the testing infrastructure. And we can also go in and analyze, because we have all the branches and we know all the, the, the branches of logic, um, you know, there, there are some test generators that will look at the, at the shape of the data and, and generate tests on that, um, but it might be that you're only using 10% of those shapes. We're actually generate, we can actually generate code based on the, the, the logic branches and make sure that we cover each of the logic branches. And we can use that as unit tests going forward to see how things would change. So I wanted to ask you, there's a bit where you were showing the glossary and stuff, and you said you encoded that. Like that was a little bit of a hand wave. Yeah, I did. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I, I personally, I, I, I actually didn't show the code because I thought it would be boring. So, but I was, but I was wondering, you know, so like, say you, you think you've got everything encoded, and but then you're comparing it against the, the actual code logic itself. I mean, and then something pops up. It's like, oh, you didn't define that. I mean, I, I guess that's that 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 is the point. So the question was, you know, you think you've done it right. But as people interact with it, they realize that you haven't. And that was actually the point of the interactive tools. Uh, it, you know, when you're dealing with business users, and a lot of the times you have business users who have uh, I'm kind of running out of time, but it, who um, who have domain knowledge, but they've forgotten it, and you're trying to automate those systems. I mean, you can use AI and all that kind of stuff, but uh, and train them. But if you're trying to get that logic out of things like traders they often forget huge bits of logic and they don't remember those huge bits of logic until you let them interact. And then they're all saying, oh wait, I totally forgot about this other thing. And that was the whole point of this interactivity is that it was a beforehand uh, approach to interactivity. Um, the point that I actually wanted to get at was that it's also very useful as a after interactive um, thing where, where you're um, auditing, 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 auditing values, and that gets back to the regulations and the audits. So the regulators often want to know that um, that you've, you know, if, if they want you to prove that you've done it correctly, and it's very hard to do that through through code. You know, um, the regulators don't read the code, so you know you have to kind of prove it somehow. And so this is a nice tool to be able to say, you know what, we say we did this. And here's actual proof. And if you want to go in and see that, you know, here's we can put it in a PDF or something, or you can actually go and interact with it if you want. All right. So here's where I think it gets most interesting. Well, it, oh wait, one more question. Okay. So this is going from the uh, requirements to code. Is it, that's what you're like. Code to requirements? Yeah. Well, that's essentially what I was showing you. Is in in part of the goal. So the question was whether we, we go from requirements to code, and do we go from code to requirements? And part of the goal with Morpher was to decrease the feedback loop of the business experts and the technologists, so that you know maybe ideally you would actually be able to sit with a, a business expert. And they would describe the logic and you have a programmer who's really good. I mean, programmers are good at converting business concepts into technical concepts. So you let the programmer do that. They do their programming thing and then show this interactive thing. And that is the way to build up the specification. But now your specification is executable code and you can document it. And it's all nicely documented and auditable, et cetera. Um, let me get into this. So this is where I think it gets really interesting in that 
all that information I just told you about, the, the glossary, the ontology, the, the logic, et cetera, we can take that out of the program again and export that into uh, an ontology. So we can have something like an LCR ontology. Uh, so we have a, a turtle exporter that, that does that. And the value of that is, is that now you've got this LCR ontology. You can hook that up to uh, an ontology that spans across regulations. So uh, there, are, there are a lot of efforts to do that. Um, and then spanning across regulations, those can be linked to other regulations. And now you can start answering the question about what regulations pertain to the, uh, to the products that I'm trading. And you can do that by going in and looking at, at the graph. And then you can go in and start saying, well, what are the differences in, in these regulations? So now that I have, so, so yeah, I mean, actually what we're looking at here is up here that we're talking about secured products. Um, that secured bit is the, is the shared ontology that spans across regulations. And then on the left and the right are two different regulations and how they deal with those with secured products. And so now we can start answering questions about how do, the, how do they actually differ? Because not only have we linked them to the ontology, but we have still, we have that still precise definition of how they treat each other, these things. And so we can see with variance analysis you know, how they treat the products differently. So it turns out that the LCR, there's a US LCR, there's a UK LCR, and there's a European LCR, and there's other LCRs as well. But, um, and they're very similar, but they do treat things differently. And so now we can go in and find out how they treat things differently. Or we could go in with the same version, or the same LCR in different versions if there's an update and we wanna know what's the impact gonna be we can go in and run that analysis and using variance analysis on the tree, we can start to see where the differences are introduced by the changes to the business logic. And we can do the same with, with data too. So if you wanted to say, reclassify a, 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 you know, a set of cash flows or whatever, how would that change the output? And we can run a, a various analysis on that. Uh, and so now we've gotten to the point where we're no longer just about execution. The, the code is actually a, a great source of all this other information. So we can get a catalog, we can get an ontology out of it. We can calculate the, the lineage. We've got transparency and we still have execution. Uh, we do that by transpiling to different languages so that it executes in, in different platforms as well. And finally, um, I did this or we did this. Uh, separately. So we programmed the LCR in an IDE. When it was done, we ran it through uh, the tools and we produced the turtle and all that stuff. Wouldn't it be great if that was all combined? If, you know, as a developer is developing these concepts, um, they can link them right there. So one of the things that we see in application code, or at least that I see a lot in application code, is that developers go through all kinds of hoops trying to build domain knowledge into their code. For example, um, what is a trade? You know, an FX option is a trade, an equity swap is a trade. Well, uh, with uh, uh, object-oriented, you know, it tends to be, well, let's define trade up front, you know, as a, as a, you know, as an interface or something like that. And we'll, we'll subclass these things. And that becomes unwieldy almost immediately. And you can't really do that across an entire firm. Um, but if you flip that, and this is what functional is really good at, if you flip that and just let the, the FX traders define an FX option and the equity traders define an equity swap, and nobody cares if it's a trade, but they can go in after the fact and categorize that using these semantic tools. Um, that's the best of both worlds. Now you can traverse, you can find out all the trades. What are all the cash flows? What are all the notionals? Because there's all these kinds of notionals. You know? And so you can start to really build up this knowledge just based on the source code and combining the power of something like functional programming with the knowledge graph in the semantic world as well. And so it's really a combination that's the best of, of both worlds. Go ahead. Could you also maybe <coughs> begin to apply formal semantics to it and, and then like look for logical inconsistencies, which might help indicate a, a problem in your... Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So the question was whether we could find problems based on, on doing that. And the answer is, yeah, totally. And there's, there's going to be tons of problems. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good tool for that. 
What are the requirements for the code? Like I see you wrote a new LCR. Yeah. The requirements for the code is that, well, in this case, I mean, there's other ways to do this. I'm not going to say that this is the only way to do it. The, the requirements for this code is that we have to be able to compile it into the more for IR. And right now, what we support are the Elm programming language. Um, we support subsets of some other languages, like so we can parse some SQL. We parse a lot of domain-specific languages, some Scala, et cetera. But that, that universe is growing. I think I'm like two seconds left. So. We have room for a couple more questions. Okay, a couple more questions. So, uh, just follow up to that point about finding the inconsistencies. I'm wondering also if you're kind of doing that sort of from the bottom up, are you also discovering hierarchies that you didn't know existed? Like this, this trait tends to be a, a, is a subtype of that one or, or this this object. Like, can you, do you do you end up discovering ontology structure as well? Uh, so the question was whether we discover ontology structures by analyzing this. Uh, and to that, I would say, if given experts like you, then probably yes. Right now, we're not. Well, no, but what I mean is, like, suppose you, like, I'm wondering if, you, if, if, if you're using the same core language and you run the reasoner, if it will actually say, it'll, it'll actually tell you to find these two classes. And by the way, this one's a subclass of that one, right? Which could be like a really, yeah, a yeah, really it's, cool. Yeah, it's a great question. So that brings me actually to my last slide, which is if you want to get involved, this is all purely open source. <laughs> 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 Here, 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 here is where to start. Uh, do we have an expert that translates the regulate? So there are actually armies and teams of experts that translate. So the, the, the steps of a regulation are that we get the regulation, it goes through legal, it goes through analysts, it goes through operations, it goes through uh, architects, it goes through developers, and eventually it gets delivered. Um, it's got a lot of steps. And again, one of the goals here is to see if we can dec decrease those steps. Uh, that was the, the, the basis for the FinOS. It's got a, FinOS is part of the Linux Foundation. It's a financial uh, open source foundation. And th they have an initiative, initiative to try to see if we can optimize the regulation landscape by delivering regulations as code. So we'll have the ability to take that and convert that into a section of code that execute those compliance. Uh, so the, que the, question, the question was whether Morpher has the capability to, to take the document? The graph. The graph. No, Morpher produces the graph. So in this case, the Morpher was used by developers to, to to the just to program the the, the regulation holistically, so um, so you know it's, it's just classic programming, classic enterprise programming. So they took the specification and converted that into a large set of code, and then that was converted to the graph. Okay. I hope you're all. Thank you. Good job.